from Las Vegas. Extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube covering Interconnect 2016. Brought to you by IBM. Now your host, John Furry and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Las Vegas for exclusive coverage of IBM Interconnect 2016. Winding down day two of uh, three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. This is theCUBE, Silicon Angle's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Dave Vellante. Excited to kind of wind down the day with a great guest, Amy Wilson. She's the author of the book, Creator's Code, lecturer at Stanford. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for taking time out of your book signing to come and join us because really love to get into the nuances of entrepreneurship and we're kind of in this new era, right? So there's always the entrepreneurial books of what's been told, are you born with it, can you learn it? I mean, obviously you teach us all, maybe I won't be too biased, but my feeling, but you know, this, that's the age old story, entrepreneurship, but now it's accelerated, it's so fast, mm -hmm. it's different, and people are trying to understand it. What's going on with entrepreneurship right now? Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a trend in the country, there's no doubt. The data actually shows that if we want to create jobs in the economy, you have to start companies that will go to scale. So all the net new jobs are with companies less than five years old. So we're seeing the proliferation of entrepreneurship and creators are everywhere. And the, and the book? Talk about the book. So the book is called The Creator's Code. Let's get it's, the prop. It's just been it handed to me here. So that is what it looks like. Um, it's based on 200 interviews with the founders of companies, creators of new ideas that have scaled businesses over 100 million in annual revenue. Uh, between five and 10 years. So founders of companies like LinkedIn, um, Airbnb, Tesla, SpaceX, uh, Dropbox, PayPal, a number of Silicon Valley companies, but also looking across. So Chipotle, Chobani, Under Armour as a sports brand, Spanx as a women's undergarment company, JetBlue as an airline, et cetera. So I um, went out and talked to all these different founders to figure out the leadership skills they had in common. Let's apply some machine learning in real time here. What's the pattern recognition? Oh, the pattern, of, sure, of that's the, the code. The code, right. cracking the code. That's so right. What is the creator's code? What, have you, what can you share? What is their habits? What do they do? What are the, what are the top things that entrepreneurs We'll do. still get the book. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well I can I tell just you downloaded it. <laughs> there are six <laughs> essential skills, right? And I'm happy to go through them rapidly if, if that's sure. interesting. Okay, yeah. so skill one is called find the gap. It's about how do you spot an opportunity or gap that other people don't see. Uh, skill two is called drive for daylight. How do you manage speed like a race car driver? So you look for the light on the horizon. It's forward focus. Um, skill three is called fly the OODA loop. And OODA stands for observe, orient, decide, act. So it's a fast decision making framework. Um, originally it was an Air Force fighter pilot framework. How could you shoot down a competitor in 40 seconds or less? You would have to observe, orient, decide, and act faster. Um, same thing in a business landscape, right? Um, skill four is called fail wisely. So this is about being smart um, and learning and learning through setbacks and testing um, ideas. Skill five is called network minds. So this is like, how do you bring brain power to you? How do you harness cognitive diversity and get other people to help um, build on ideas to solve problems we haven't solved before? And then the sixth skill is called gift small goods. And this is one of the ideas behind LinkedIn. Uh, we were talking about Reid Hoffman. The idea is um, a small good or would be a small favor, a small kindness, a way to help a colleague. If you are generously gifting those forward, um, we used to say that it was morally right to be a nice guy or be a good colleague. Nice now guys it actually, finish you know, first. Well, so I just wrote a piece for Fortune called Nice Guys Finish First, Not Last. Because we used to say, oh, nice guys finish last. Or, you know, you kind of get trampled on or you get people in front of you. In fact, now, if you're collaborative and helpful to your colleagues, um, your reputation is transparent. We know, we can find information on LinkedIn or on social media, we can Google you. If you're helpful, ideas come to you, deal flow comes to you, talent comes to you, it actually makes you a lot more productive. That's so, the network effect kind of in working towards somebody. That's right. So some of these are tried and true. Um, you know, the, the, the classic Napoleon Hill, power of positive thinking, actually is, is not in here, which interestingly enough, I don't know if it's explicit, you know, paying it forward, but, but the, the pieces that are really new are the speed. I mean, right. that has changed. Mm -hmm. um, talk more about that. What did you learn and, and why is that? So, um, 
certainly technology is speeding everything up. So one of these skills is called Fly the OODA Loop, this Observe, Orient, Decide, Act framework. And the PayPal team is a great example of you have to observe things that other people won't see. Um, there's a lot of academic literature here about alertness, where people will catch something out of the corner of their eye, but often we're in our routine and you dismiss it. You know, so you might experience something, but you, you completely ignore. Um, the difference is you have to observe quickly. You have to orient quickly and make a decision quickly and then take an action. If you can do that, the PayPal um, team did it six times. So in 18 months, that company was six different things. They sold to eBay. The more interesting concept here is that the original 12 people at PayPal, they go on to start the whole next wave of the internet. Um, and it's when the tech bubble burst in 2002. I was coming out of Stanford Business School at the time. It was doom and gloom in the valley. Yeah. People just thought technology was Nuclear over. Nuclear winter as they said. Oh, yeah. it was terrible, right? Um, that team goes on to start LinkedIn, YouTube, Yelp, Yammer, Slide, Tesla, Dig, Genie. They've put the first money behind Facebook, and the list goes on and on. And so when you actually dive in and say, well, how are you able to not only do this once, but over and over and over, um, and you spend time with all of those different founders, what they start talking about is observing things that people miss, acting quickly, deciding based on counterintuitive data, maybe, and taking action. Was it because they, they failed smartly or that they had the DNA of their experience with PayPal? Can you root it back? What observations did you take away from that? Because PayPal was a success. I mean, yes, it was. I mean some would argue it could have been even more successful, but there are some stories of those guys kind of had the coming of age in PayPal. Right. They were a bunch of geeks kind of hanging out, doing their thing. But they had multiple near-death experiences, right? So PayPal almost didn't survive multiple times. So the formative so, years, were, was that a part of it? I think, well, I, yeah, so this is part of the idea. On the nature-nurture debate, I'm on the nurture side. You can learn, right? So this is the argument that, yeah, they learned quite a lot, and then they took it forward in all the other companies that they started. So, um, you know, I think the skill set, the six skills, learnable, teachable, accessible, it doesn't require a credential or a degree or what perfect timing. What so we heard, you we, we heard on the cube earlier. <laughs> what? And what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah, I think, yeah. well, as long, this is, so the fail wisely idea is um, failure is almost a badge of honor in Silicon Valley as long as you I'm, learn. I got a lot of badges. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> um, but the, here, here's the thing is you can't keep failing the same way. That is not That's smart. insanity. Right, yeah, that, you know, so if you uh, are learning through setbacks and you're more resilient and you're gaining information and you're redirecting your course, that actually is pretty wise. And this, uh, this other one, the network of, of minds, right. I, mean, I can't wait to read the book. I eat this stuff up. I've been chasing windmills for a long time. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, and I think of, you know, the Mastermind Alliance. You've heard, heard that one before, but what's, again, I'm looking for differences. Of the, the network can be a lot bigger, a lot faster, a lot more social. That's right. What can you tell us about how that's sort of changed, that network effect? So um, the idea of getting other brain power to help you solve problems, we can do it online and we can do it offline. And so now you, there's a company in this book called Innocentive, and they are um, you know, sourcing different seekers and solvers to solve problems. And what Alf Bingham likes to say, who's the founder of Innocentive, is you can find the teenager in Romania who can solve your scientific problem. You can be sitting in California, you can be sitting in Las Vegas. If you can put out a problem and define it specifically and set, you set criteria around it, you can harness the brain power of people who are very, very far away. Um, that's new, that's totally different, and it's fast. If it's you do instrumented it well, you too, you can address, quickly. it's addressable people. It's right. real-time communication with mm -hmm. the way the web works now. That's right. Global, the world's flat, if you, if you will. Right, that's right. Economics. Well, we heard, we heard a phrase in the cube earlier this morning uh, from, from, from a guest, and we, it was talking about another topic, but the word paranoid and self-aware came up. So I can think of Andy Grove's book, sure. you know, Paranoid Survive, and being self-aware, which is kind of this new thesis mm -hmm. of, hey, you know, be aware and observe. Be alert, right. So talk about those dynamics, because that's kind of back to your observational thing. Paranoid people were like, oh my God, I'm a competitor, am I going to get shot down? Uh, right. You know, whoever, whatever metaphor. So are those tied into this, because those are concepts that worked well. Intel has You're Right, I think that's true. So I think it's a lot about curiosity, which sort of dovetails with what you're saying. I, I, paranoia, I'm not so sure. I mean, I think that the... Uh, that that has been a mantra that a lot of people have thought about. That just is to stay alert and stay on your feet. 
Um, I think it, it's creating new concepts, companies, initiatives, ideas, it takes a lot of confidence. So whether we call that paranoia or we call it uh, believing in, that your work matters, persevering, grit, I mean, there's a lot of other um, words for it that are being used now. But I think curiosity is huge. So um, there, there is research that shows that an average five-year-old will ask about 100 questions a day. And then as we age, people ask less and less questions. The big difference with people who will create new concepts, business ideas, is they keep probing. So if you spend time with Elon Musk, and he's featured in this book for Tesla and SpaceX, and I've spent some time with him, he is filled with questions all the time. Can we build a reusable rocket? Can we land a rocket on a sheet of flame? Can we build a car with 7,000 tiny batteries? Why not? What are the constraints? How do we remove them? You know, I mean, it's Curious mind, this, really, oh, is always on, looking on, on, for on. some intoxicating, you know, ingredient to feed that, you know, intellectual. Right. So I think that, you know, that is the overarching sort of framework, I think. You have to be curious and you have to be willing to be uncomfortable. And how's, ask and so how's I mean IBM's got this whole cognitive cognition thing going on which we love. It's got a big data angle to it. A lot of tech involved, and a lot of stuff we're talking about we see every day in Silicon Valley. The pay it forward certainly very community right. is a back channel, is a front channel, <laughs> Game of Thrones, whatever metaphor you want to yeah. use. But outside of Silicon Valley, how is the book being received? Because people want to emulate kind of the Silicon Valley formula, mm -hmm. but now you have this cultural shift where a 15-year-old in Romania could do something insightful and be part of a virtual Silicon right. Valley. Right. So give us an update there, because Tina Seelig talks about the same thing too. Sure. So the book is in all English-speaking worlds. Simon and Schuster brought it out. I literally yesterday flew home from India and Sri Lanka. I've just spent the last six weeks in Asia. Um, we released the book in Chinese in September. So China is, you know, 1.3 billion people. India is 1.2 billion people. Um, <laughs> together, they make up 40% of the population of the earth, right? Um, so I'm over there 1 now. 1% penetration will be good on the yeah. book sales. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, let's, let's think positively about that, right? Um, but it is a global economy that we operate in. The data set behind this book is US. And so still, if you want to start and scale a new idea that is all over the globe, Silicon Valley is a pow powerful place to do that. Um, but I, I don't think that there's any reason to think that the next ideas are not coming out of Shenzhen or Shanghai or Bangalore or Mumbai or Delhi or, you know, I mean, we're going to yeah, see they're, global they're, I mean, innovation in, in India and, and Asia, it used to be outshoring. Now, there are real product teams out there, right. real intellectual property being developed, I meaning different politics and whatnot, but still, from a technology perspective, right. huge shift. And that wasn't like that 10 years ago. Yeah, there's an argument to be made that in China, that Baidu and Tencent and Alibaba, their three huge technology companies, are ahead of the U.S. technology players. Um, and there are different innovations that you see um, there. WeChat, for example, is a platform that would have online the ability to book a car, that would be our Uber, um, monitor your health, that would be our Fitbit, uh, find a date, that would be Tinder, mm -hmm. book a doctor's appointment, that would be the My Health Care, all the different platforms yeah. online. I mean, you can do all of that on one platform in China. So, for example, that is ahead of the U.S. marketplace, I think. So what is the new code that be cracked? So beyond the book, as you look forward, What's next? What is the, the dot that, gets, that connects? Where's the arrow being shooting forward to? Well, here's one thing that I think is interesting about the research process behind this book and then where it's um, grabbing some attention, and that is in the corporate space. So the data set here is founders of new companies, um, but there's a huge appetite that I'm finding, it's somewhat surprising to me, in how do you create inside a large structure? Is it the same skill set? And I think it is, it's the same six skills, um, but you can create and scale inside of IBM, that's pretty important, or inside of GE, or inside of a lot of the really big um, companies globally. And so I think that is, in many cases, the next frontier. But that's not the audience for whom you wrote this book. Who, um, who, who'd you write this book for? You know, this has got a pretty broad-based audience, and so it's definitely creators of new companies. And I teach at Stanford Business School, so there's a whole wave of, you know, next people that are coming into the marketplace. Um, it is also, though, for people who are aged 30 to 50, and the data shows that an average first-time founder in the United States is 39 years old. It is not a 20-something wearing a hoodie and flip-flops in Silicon Valley. We, we so think I founded my first company, 39. 39, is yeah. that right? Yeah. yeah. Well, then you're right on, you know, on the, the trend. On the yeah. number. So we're seeing a lot Two of people. years ago? Yeah, Thank just a couple John. years ago. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also what we're seeing in the U.S. is the baby boomers are creating companies in greater numbers than their millennial kids are. 
Um, and so that's counterintuitive. That's not what we think. Um, but people are living longer. They're, you know, wanting to have other experiences. Not everyone wants to play golf. They're happy to go out and start a company. Um, and millennials tend to be risk averse now because they're carrying big student loans. What's the business and, school you know, vibe right now at Stanford? I'm obviously business schools change. I mean, you know, venture capital's changing, how the, the funding's changing, the entrepreneurs, op, entrepreneurship seems to be off the charts. Computer science at Stanford sold out basically in the enrollment, huge. Right. Um, how is that changing the, the business school? Are people like springing with ideas? Is it flourishing? I mean, are people like going crazy with all these new ideas? What's the vibe Everybody's right got a business plan like yeah. Hollywood scripts. <laughs> is, it, is it like yeah. that? Is it, yeah. is it, how robust is it in the business school in Well, Stanford? you know, so Stanford is an amazing place to begin with. The business school is now all individualized curriculum. And this is what really distinguishes Stanford Business School from other business schools. I spent the last five years at Harvard, and I just have um, moved back to Silicon Valley to teach at Stanford. Um, and that, I'm voting with my feet, let's just say that. Like, I'm very happy to be back on the West Coast, and I'm very happy to be at Stanford. Well, wasn't that the um, whole point of Stanford, right? To build something better than Harvard anyway. Well, well I, or I, to build I something new. <laughs> to build something new yeah, and yeah, to yeah. be um, very forward-looking. The, the building is beautiful, the new uh, business school. Yeah, oh, it's, a great, it's a great center. Okay, so you voted with your feet, I'm just yeah. intrigued. What yeah. makes it great is um, the collaborative nature of it and the entrepreneurial nature of it and the personalized experience of it. Um, so students, if they're interested in China, are doing exchange programs with China. If they're really interested in marketing, they can target their curriculum towards that. If they're really interested in finance, they can be going deep in finance very early. Um, and so the MBA is becoming something that is individualized more and more That's to great. what students like are that. really um, curious about. I mean, it's back to this curiosity thing. Yeah. So, and undoubtedly, it's a place for entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. Yeah, right? it's certainly. It's Stanford's a great campus. Love it. I live in my kids go to Palo Alto High School right across the street. I just renewed my season tickets. This How good. <laughs> Again. We just won the Rose Bowl. Yeah. Absolutely. Go Cardinal. <laughs> yeah. People think yeah. I'm a Stanford. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was good. I love Stanford. Wash you know, They got a good football team now. So, well, we're, thank you so much for spending the thank time you. Yeah, and the book. Thank you. We really appreciate it. And, and congratulations. Thank you. We'll see you around town in Palo Alto. I look forward uh, to it. Business School. This is The Cube bringing you all the action, cracking the code, cognition, cognitive thinking, sharing the data. Amy Wilkinson, thanks for joining us. Author here on The Cube. We'll be right back with more coverage tomorrow, day three. All the top guests are coming in tomorrow. Top players, all the leaders, the most powerful people in the enterprise tomorrow. We'll be right back tomorrow. See you tomorrow. All right.